Good afternoon, everyone. Hope we're all fed and watered and not too sleepy because we've got a, a great panel discussion coming up for you this afternoon. Uh, my name is Jess, like Adele said, and I'm Head of Corporate Affairs and Government Relations at GrainCorp and very delighted to join you today from the heathen state of New South Wales. Thank you for that, James. Um, to discuss the development of a domestic low carbon liquid fuels industry in Australia and the key drivers that will get us there. From GrainCorp's perspective, this topic speaks directly to the heart of our ambitions and our commitment to contribute to a more sustainable and resilient energy landscape in Australia. Many of you would be familiar with GrainCorp, um, but for those who aren't, I have heard us described when in this state as um, the East Coast cousins with the crap weather. Uh, we're much more than that, I do guarantee. And we are pretty much a cornerstone of the grain supply chain on the East Coast um, and have been for over 100 years. We've got the grains business. We operate a network of receival sites and ports stretching from central Queensland all the way down to uh, the south coast um, of Victoria. And we store and shift a wide range of grains, pulses and oil seeds through that network. So as you can imagine, it's where we're coming into a very busy time with harvest kicking off on the east coast as well. We have several trading offices spanning from right here in Perth, where we buy and sell wheat, barley, canola, oats, lupins, etc., from Western Australian growers every year. And we have several locations across Asia, the UK, and in the Black Sea. And we also source locally through our joint venture business in Canada. We are also a leading crusher and producer of canola oil, and we currently operate two crushing sites, one based here in WA in Pinjarra, and the other in Newmerca in northeast Victoria. Our nutrition and energy side of the business produces edible oils and shortenings for the food production industry, and we develop and market animal feeds and supplements and produce biofuel components as well, which we'll talk about in a moment. So this energy side of our business is arguably the, the lesser known branch, but it still packs a punch. Uh, we are the leading supplier across Australia and New Zealand of agri-energy feedstocks, as we call them. We're the largest accumulator of tallow in Australia and New Zealand and recently celebrated 100 years in that business. And we are one of only two national used cooking oil collectors in Australia through our Auscoal business. So look out for the, the big green trucks driving around Australia and collecting oil from KFC and McDonald's and the like. Much of what we collect or produce here in Australia is exported to customers overseas. Our nation's grain growers produce much more than we can eat. So I was very pleased to hear the discussion up here about food versus fuel earlier. Uh, we do have a surplus average of nearly 5 million tonnes of canola exported annually overseas, and that's from the last three to five years. Um, last year, I think around 3 million of that did come from Western Australian growers, and the vast majority of it is refined into biofuels, as I believe uh, Minister Jarvis touched on this morning, some of which is obviously imported back into Australia to serve our transport sector. And we see an opportunity to capture uh, the production of these fuels onshore in Australia and to pass that value of that opportunity back through the supply chain to our growers who produce those high quality feedstocks. GrainCorp recently announced a memorandum of understanding with industry super owned global fund manager IFM Investors and energy company Ampol to explore the establishment of an integrated renewable fuels industry on our shores. And to that end, we're progressing with plans to expand our existing crushing operations that I mentioned by up to 1 million tonnes to provide canola oil feedstock supply for refining into renewable fuels. And we're looking at locations on the west and the east coast, so uh, watch this space. We have recently been selected to represent the feedstock sector on the federal government's Jet Zero Council that Brendan uh, referred to earlier today. And of course, as part of that, we're consulting very closely with growers and producers to support that national feedstock strategy that he mentioned, with the likes of canola, sugarcane, non-food crops and ag waste set to form the foundations of a low carbon liquid fuels industry in Australia. So they're just a couple of reasons of why we're so pleased to be here with you today and sponsoring this important panel discussion. The drivers for developing a domestic low carbon liquid fuels industry are multifaceted and all of the presenters that we've heard from today um, have really touched on uh, the important drivers in various ways. So I'm gonna run through it at pretty much a macro level just to summarize before introducing our panel guests. First and foremost, we all acknowledge the urgent need to decarbonize. The transport and aviation sectors are among our nation's largest contributors to greenhouse gas emissions and drop-in fuels, such as biodiesel, renewable diesels, and sustainable aviation fuel are the pathway currently available to reducing the carbon intensity of these hard-to-abate sectors. 
Sustainability obviously isn't just about reducing emissions, it's about resilience. And so we've been talking a bit today about energy security. And as mentioned, Australia has long relied on imported fossil fuels to meet its needs. And that leaves us vulnerable to global market fluctuations and geopolitical tensions. Another, another driver I wanted to touch on is market demand. So the shift towards low carbon solutions is being driven obviously not just by industry and governments, um, but by consumers and industries alike. In sectors like aviation, mining, long haul rail, heavy transport, the demand for greener alternatives is growing and it's not going away. Major corporations are committing to net zero targets, as we know, and they're looking for partners who can provide sustainable solutions at scale and at speed. So by investing in renewable fuel production, we can offer our customers and supply chain partners the traceable, sustainable options that they're after. And excitingly for companies like Grain Corp and the agriculture industry that we sit within, uh, the new technology that we've been talking about today promises to create a new domestic market for farmers, helping to increase and diversify demand while at the same time uh, providing jobs in regional areas where those critical fuel feedstocks are grown and processed. Of course, none of this happens in isolation. We've talked a lot in the last 24 hours as well around collaboration. It's essential to realising the full potential of this new industry. And uh, I've had some great conversations over the last 24 hours about government and industry and researchers and communities all working together to um, find and create the right policy frameworks, uh, invest in the necessary infrastructure and develop the technologies that will help to drive this sector forward. And as we'll hear from our panel guests today, uh, efforts are underway across the transport and maritime, mining, infrastructure and agriculture sectors to turn these drivers into a reality. And I'm very much looking forward to a fruitful discussion on that in the next 45 minutes. So um, to run through our panel speakers, Mark Hammond from the uh, Truck Industry Council will join us first, followed by Angela Gillam of the Maritime Industry Australia Limited. Pauline Kennedy from BP is up third. Uh, Lee Penny and Emma Kindness from Langer Rock to come in as well, and then Tamar Jordan from Rio Tinto will wrap us up. So with that, I'd like to hand over to Mark Hammond as our first speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Jess, and uh, thank you to Bioenergy Australia for the, uh, the invitation to talk at this summit today. don't know what's going on. Okay, here we go. Okay, so uh, my name's Mark Hammond. I'm the Chief Technical Officer at the Truck Industry Council, or TIC. Okay, so who is TIC? Uh, we're the peak industry body who represent the truck manufacturers, uh, importers and distributors here in Australia. Uh, vehicles or trucks are above three and a half ton GVM. Uh, our members are uh, responsible uh, for manufacturing and importing 18 brands across Australia. Um, and last year, uh, our members provided 99% of all trucks uh, to market here. TIC's positioning statement is today's trucks safer, greener and essential. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about sort of the, the uh, I guess, the industry generally um, and talk about sort of... Um, the different pathways, I guess, unlike aviation, um, which typically has only got sort of a, well, the best pathway, the only, the only real pathway for them is, is sustainable aviation fuel. Um, in the road transport sector, there are different technologies, different pathways uh, that we can take. Some are at different levels of maturity. Uh, some will evolve over a, a period of time, that period of time, you know, being a number of decades in, in case of some of the technologies. So, um, it's, it's important to, I guess, understand a bit more about uh, the sector uh, and those pathways um, and the transition which will definitely evolve. So currently in Australia we have about three quarters of a million trucks on our roads. By 2030 that's expected to grow to 850,000 and that's due to the ever-growing freight tasks. From the day one that sort of a, a truck went on the road in Australia sort of, um, you know, there been, uh, our CO2 emissions have grown year on year. Uh, and it is because of, you know, population growing, sort of um, other industries, uh, mining, agriculture, things like that. Um, 
The average age of a truck uh, in Australia is 15 years, so total life of a truck is 30 years. So a new truck sold today in 2024 uh, won't be retired from the fleet till 2054. So a very long asset life, those trucks are going to be around for a long time. And the majority of those trucks being sold at the moment um, are diesel. So 1% of new trucks sold in Australia this year uh, will be uh, low emission, so battery electric hybrids, or zero emission, um, so uh, battery electric trucks. Uh, that's up 61% over sales last year. Uh, and while you think, well, that's pretty, pretty low, uh, the global average uh, for uptake for zero emission trucks is actually only running at 1.5%. So we're not too far behind when you consider that many other countries have got a lot of incentives in place to uh, foster the, the uptake of zero emission vehicles. Um, we have very few here in Australia. So at 1% and, uh, and on the way up, we think we're not doing too bad at this stage. Um, and at the moment there, the brands, uh, the green circles are, are battery electric vehicles that you can purchase uh, in Australia and the, uh, the blue circle um, around Hino is a, a hybrid, series of hybrid vehicles that they offer. So uh, over half our members have got um, um, zero emission or low emission uh, vehicle offerings for sale in Australia at the moment. Um, all those vehicles that are being sold, um, and there are about 500 zero emission vehicles on our roads at the moment, they're all running around city, metro, urban environments. The, that's where the, the technology works at this point in time. There's currently no technical or economically viable solution for our industry for line haul, mass constrained freight, remote area freight. So, the, the picture of those vehicles up there, there is no option at the moment other than running those on diesel. Uh, if you have a look at um, the makeup of the Australian fleet, about 630,000 trucks or 84% um, run around uh, cities. So they're those small, medium and, and some of the larger trucks too running around sort of our city environments. But that 84% of trucks only uses 40% of the diesel consumed. 60% of that diesel is consumed by just 120,000 trucks. That makes up 16% of the fleet. Um, and that part of the fleet, as I said, is, is the fleet that uh, at the moment there is no battery electric or zero emission sort of alternative for. So even if we could shift 630,000 trucks overnight to, um, to battery electric, um, we'd still only abate 40% of the emissions in the sector. So um, we've been doing some forecasting and modelling. Uh, we believe that by uh, 2030, so five and a half years time, um, about one in five trucks, so 20% of new trucks will be zero emissions. So we expect to sell uh, in, in, in a typical year, we sell about 40,000 new trucks. We think about 10,000 of those new trucks in 2030 will be zero emission. Um, it's a pretty optimistic, considering that uh, we've, um, we've only, we will probably only sell two to 300 um, zero emission trucks this year. It's, it's a pretty fair jump sort of in, in the next five, five or so years. Um, but we believe optimistically that by 2030, we'll see about 20,000 zero emission trucks on our roads. That will represent only 2% of the fleet, and it'll only abate 1% of the CO2 emissions, because those vehicles are running around city, metro, they're not, the vehicles they're, dis the, the diesel vehicles they're displacing are actually not using a lot of diesel. So you might think 20,000 trucks is a fair bit, it's actually not gonna make much of a difference to CO2 in Australia at, at this point in time. But it's really important that we continue to, to put those vehicles on the road, because over a period of time, we will start to see some significant sort of abatements from those vehicles. So by 2030, about 98% of all trucks are still gonna require diesel. So as I said, we must foster the uptake of those zero emission trucks, uh, battery electric in particular, where that we're in uh, the uh, segments um, that they will, um, that where they're profitable, where they'll, where they'll work, uh, where they work. Um, because by 2035, 2040, we will then have sort of a, a significant number of them on the road and we will start to see a significant decarbonisation from, from that cohort of vehicle. Um, 
So this is some modelling that we've done. Um, the, the red bar across the bottom is the expected CO2 growth in Australia from uh, heavy vehicle road transport from 2025 to 2030. So expecting just over 2.5 million tonnes uh, of CO2 growth. That's not total, that's just extra emissions, uh, CO2 emissions we're gonna see from the growth of the freight task over the next five years. And on vertical axis is the different technologies, I guess, that, that we have available uh, at the moment. Um, and we've modelled each of those. So if you look at the first three, so anyone in the room who's sort of, uh, there is actually a line there, you can't see it for hydrogen, but sort of, um, we, we don't see that in the short term, hydrogen is, is going to be anything um, used any, for anything uh, other than trials uh, for trucks in Australia. Um, the up uptake of uh, Euro 6 trucks, so they come online sort of later this year uh, as a mandate as we move to ADO, ADO 4, so Euro 6. Uh, they have a 5 to 6% sort of um, fuel saving, but again, it doesn't actually translate into significant CO2 savings. Equally, those diesel electric hybrid trucks I spoke about, while they're about 30% more efficient than a, a, a diesel truck only, um, because we're not going to have a lot of them on our roads, uh, again, we're not going to see a lot of abatement. Battery electric, so those 20,000 battery electric trucks that, uh, that we hope will be on our roads by uh, 2030, that's about the CO2 saving we can expect from them. Uh, productivity. Um, this is a, an area that, that's not being explored a lot in Australia, but um, about 50% of all articulated trucks, so trucks that tow a trailer, are still semi, so they're only towing a single trailer. The rest are B-doubles, road trains, multi-trailer combinations. Uh, we've modelled just moving 10% of um, those single trailer um, semis to be doubles, um, and that's the, the CO2 benefit from that. And we believe that's quite conservative. We think you could double, even triple, sort of um, the, um, the transition from semi to, to be double or to uh, higher productivity vehicles. So that then brings me on to sort of low carbon fuels. So an R10 fuel uh, run across the entire truck fleet will give about that much abatement. Um, so 10%. Um, well, yeah, uh, so you can see, uh, compared to the, the other technologies between now and 2030, probably through to 2035, uh, low carbon fuels have by far the greatest potential to decarbonise. Once we get to 2035, 2040, we will start to see 100,000 100, plus zero emission battery electric trucks on our roads and uh, we will start to see some significant decarbonisation uh, from, from that, um, that group of vehicles. But certainly sort of in the short term, uh, low carbon fuels. Now the astute of you will also notice that sort of even if you put all those together, we'll actually be creating more CO2 emissions from this sector in 2030 than we, uh, we will be sort of next year. Um, so uh, I guess if we were to go to an R20, so a 20% blend, um, we could actually start to decrease uh, the emissions um, from this sector for the first time ever. So um, uh, just very quickly, so summarising, uh, we need to maximise the opportunity of putting battery electric vehicles on our roads. Um, we need to, to build up that, that cohort of vehicles uh, over the next couple of decades. Um, we need to look at freight uh, productivity improvements uh, because there are some, some significant gains to be had there. Uh, but by far the best way, short to mid-term, um, solutions sort of to, to reduce CO2 in the, the uh, road transport sector is uh, with renewable fuels. And just finally, um, and supporting other abatement measures I think is, is probably a bit questionable at this stage until the, the technologies mature more. Um, I shall leave it there. Um, you can get some more information from our, from our website. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Angela Gillam from Maritime Industry Australia. Um, it's my very great pleasure to be here again with the, um, I guess, the non-SAF travelling roadshow, as we are. Um, and I think it's really important that we are here because um, I think the biofuel picture, the potential picture for Australia is more than SAF. SAF is a very big part of it, um, but there are significant emissions reduction opportunities um, that exist 
in a whole range of hard to abate industries, which I know many of you are aware, and, and maritime is one of them. So I'm going to take you through a very, very high level. There's, I don't think there's any graphs, so I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing in my presentation. Um, you know, I could, delete, I could speak all day about the challenges that the international shipping industry is facing in decarbonising. It is the biggest issue, I can promise you that, that, that the international industry is discussing at the moment um, and has been for quite some years now. So, um, but uh, I think it's important to sort of describe the context in Australia as well, so, so that's what I'm going to do. Uh, just for context, who's Maritime Industry Australia Limited? We're essentially the, the peak body representing the Australian shipping industry, but we have quite a, a diverse membership cohort. So we include um, not just Australian flagships, although they are within our membership. Um, our membership also includes international trading ships under a range of flags um, and ownership arrangements. We also have members in the domestic commercial vessel industry, so those um, smaller vessels that actually never trade internationally, um, oil majors, cargo owners, um, miners with an interest in shipping or ownership of, of vessels and assets. So that's who we are. Uh, so the maritime industry in Australia, again, it's very diverse and it's a really important economic contributor. Um, there's 22,000 or around that number. It's actually quite hard to know precisely how many there are um, domestic commercial vessels. And they include uh, tugs, um, lines boats, pilot boats. So those really important facilitators of international trade um, that are really important for um, the big ships to actually berth at our ports um, and enable international exports. Um, fishing vessels, again, really important construction vessels, passenger ferries, um, Sydney ferries, um, the ferries in, in Brisbane all fall within this domestic commercial vessel category. Some of them are actually open to electrification and I'll talk about this a little bit further on. Um, and some of them probably you would call them the low hanging fruit, although they're not that low hanging and it is still really, really difficult to decarbonise um, in, in this sector. I think a really important point to make is uh, the, the, the huge transport task that will be decarbonised um, by addressing emissions from the international shipping industry. Um, so, you know, 80% of Australia's imports and exports are carried by sea. Uh, one of the biggest challenges for our industry is the fact that we're out of sight, out of mind, and there's very few opportunities for us to connect with consumers. Um, unlike aviation, I think that's quite an advantage for aviation. Um, most of the shipping that happens um, internationally is, is sort of B2B, so it's, it's dry bulk or it's bulk liquids, um, and there's not that sort of um, consumer relationship which kind of makes it difficult when you're, when you're look, talking about increasing costs. <clears throat> um, international shipping is subject to um, international regulations. So we have had international uh, regulations imposed upon us um, for quite some time, there's, there's efficient technical efficiency standards for new builds, which are, are ratcheting up over time. And we also have what's called the carbon intensity um, indicator, which is an operational carbon intention, intensity standard that came into force last year. There's some significant technical challenges, long distances, like really, really long distances from one end of the, the globe to the other. Um, huge energy requirement, I mean, pushing steel through the resistance of water, just thinking about it in that way, it's not, it, these, these vessels are huge, they have huge cargo carrying capacity, the energy requirement is, is phenomenal, and so the sort of scale that we're, we're requiring in terms of replaceable energy, something that will, will replace fossil fuel, is, is really significant. Um, we need to be able to have security of supply, travelling around the world, we need, we need to be able to bunker the fuel that we need at different port locations, um, and energy density is an issue. So using fossil fuel, um, it's very, very effective at, at, at um, what it does, and, and so we need to be able to uh, utilise a, a product that has similar or, or near similar um, energy density that, that enables us to, to travel those long distances. And I think one of the things that it gets forgotten a lot uh, is the, the, the global economy is, is addicted to, to cheap shipping 
it, it is a very low cost way to move huge amounts of material around the world. Um, and, and I think that's one of the fundamental issues is the capacity for the global economy to absorb an increase in shipping cost because that's, that's what's gonna happen. And long asset life, um, like Mark's trucks, our vessels, um, 20, 30, 35 years. So vessels that are around today, being built today, will be around for 30 years. Now is a terrible time to build a ship. I mean, there is no certainty around engine type, fuel type, fuel security, um, what regulations are coming down the line from the International Maritime Organization. So the, the, the asset life is, is a, real, um, a real challenge, which is why a drop-in solution is so attractive. Um, this has not worked out very well. This table doesn't, isn't supposed to look like that. But what I'm trying to <laughs> demonstrate there, and if you want to get in touch with me afterwards, there's a fabulous table that's unavailable to you today. We have a suite of options available to us. We have ammonia, methanol, hydrogen, electrification. Um, some of them will work for some sectors. As I said, electrification is probably suitable for domestic commercial vessel sectors. So short voyages um, at, from port to port, there's certain uh, sectors that, that that will work very well. It's still very high cost, um, you know, double the cost of a new build to build an electri electrified vessel. Um, ammonia, it's probably, depending on who you ask, honestly, a decade or two decades away. There's a whole range of safety concerns around the use of ammonia. Some people say, no way, never, not on my ship, not in my port, not in my jurisdiction. Um, and others just think it's the absolute golden chalice. So this, this is the kind of uncertainty that, we, that we're facing at the moment. Um, methanol, another great solution. Um, lots of people are putting all their eggs in the methanol basket. Again, lower energy density. You need to bunker more frequently. Um, the technology is there. So this is the other point. It isn't, it isn't, it's no longer really a technical question. The ammonia burning engines are there. They've done the research, the R&D. They can make them. They're not commercially viable. But at the moment, it's really an economic and policy issue as opposed to a technical issue. Um, and, and surrounding that is the regulatory um, issues, the, the infrastructure, the supply chains, and, and just the general supply at scale that we need. Right down the bottom of that table <laughs> is where I talk about biofuel. And uh, so biofuel, biodiesel, renewable diesel, drop-in fuel for, for this shipping industry and can, and, and can be applicable across the domestic commercial vessel um, and the international trading ship sector. So it is a really attractive option for us, um, but there are some challenges. So what do we need? Just with every other um, sector that we're utilising uh, renewable fuels, we need integrity in life cycle accounting and there's lots of work happening at the IMO actually around developing life cycle assessment for a range of fuel types. Um, we need certainty of supply at scale. We're talking a, about a huge, huge energy need. So, so scale sort of beyond um, what, what is able to be provided today. And I hate to say it, but we need something close to price parity or a global um, regulatory framework that requires all operators to, to adopt whatever the, whatever the renewable fuel is um, available. So we need a level playing field. Um, just last week, the International Maritime Organization sort of was working towards what will likely be the outcome, which is a global levy on, on bunker fuel. Um, industry is very supportive of that. Um, it's, it's absolutely something that's needed to close the price gap and provide the right market signals just to the producers to, to really invest in scaling up to provide the fuels that we need because we're not going to be able to decarbonise without the energy producers on board. Um, and that's a very high level overview. So I really look forward to any questions, nice questions, Dave Evans. Um, when we, when we have our Q&A, so thank you. Hi everyone, I think I'll be the smallest presenter for today, so hopefully you can see my head at least. Um, we're progressively getting shorter, I think, so. Um, I'm Pauline Kennedy, I, um, I work with BP. I'm the Low Carbon Policy and Advocacy Manager for Australia and New Zealand. 
Um, and today I just thought we'd talk a little bit um, about uh, BP's plans here, but I think I'll focus, because it's mostly my job, um, where I work between the commercial teams and, um, and the policy space to sort of work out what our, um, our projects need and what our customers need um, as well. So, um, we'll just see, hopefully I'm able to get this to work. Okay, so I guess um, at BP we um, we sort of tend to have our strategies in, um, and underpinning for our uh, investments really focused on our customers and obviously our business. Um, and so we have we've kind of been thinking um, not just about uh, liquid fuels, which of course we have a very large presence in Australia and globally in fossil liquid fuels. Um, but also we've been, um, we've been sort of thinking about, uh, you know, hydrogen. I here in Western Australia, we have three large low carbon hydrogen projects under development. Um, uh, we also have uh, BP, Pol um, BP Pulse, which is an EV charging network that we're rolling out. Um, we have our uh, JV partner, Lightsource BP, that's a very major, uh, renewables um, developer here in Australia as well, including in the West. So I guess our perspective is to try and have the energy vector that the different customers need. Um, and uh, you know, kind of this is the sort of this is just an illustration. This would be different depending on the customer and depending on what um, what their needs are. But you can kind of see, you know, it isn't a sort of competition, or it's definitely this for mining, and it's definitely that um, uh, for shipping, as we've heard. Um, you know, it will really depend on what that end use is, um, what the customer needs, and it might change over time. And the technologies um, may not be uh, commercial now, or might not be competing against each other now, but in the future, uh, they may. And so. You know, when you're trying to make investments in long-lived assets like we are in um, in Australia, in hydrogen, in electricity, and and also in liquid fuels, um, we've got to kind of have a view about how we see uh, the future unfolding for our customers. Okay. So, I mean, this is, I guess, why we're um, investing, I guess, in, in multiple energy vectors, and it brings us to the Kwinana Integrated Energy Hub. Um, so, most of you, um, if you're from Western Australia, you would know that we had a um, very long history of refining in, in Kwinana, uh, and our um, refinery closed a couple of years ago, and we've been um, running the site as a an import terminal supplying quite a lot of the fuel here um, in the south um, uh, for Western Australia and also fuel into the um, airport. Uh, so we've been thinking about what we're going to do with our site uh, and thinking about what our customers need. And so some of you came down to visit um, during the week. So we've got plans for um, a renewable fuels uh, um, uh, plant to produce renewable fuels there, so it's called the Quinana Renewable Fuels Plant. Uh, and it would be using the heifer process that we've heard about, um, and we would be having flexibility to produce um, so the SPK, which would then be blended to make SAF, to be precise for the people who um, have asked for that, um, and also renewable diesel, or HBO, depending on what you call it, uh, and then also some bionaphtha as well. Uh, and we've designed the plant to um, be kind of flexible and, um, and respond to what the market needs and what the, um, the market is telling us is the best thing um, to produce. We are also planning to have um, both imports and domestic um, uh, feedstocks. So uh, some of you who came down to Kwinana um, would have seen the um, CBH and the, and the canola, a lot of the West Australian canola leaves from just down the road from us. Um, and Cargill's been talking uh, in the events over the, um, over the week as well about their, um, their plans for a crusher. And so that would be really um, beneficial for a project like uh, Kwinana. 
uh, but we'll also uh, have our um, ability to import and have flexibility with the kind of um, uh, feedstocks that we would use. And then, of course, we need some hydrogen for, um, for the process and so it we will need additional hydrogen and that is underpinning um, a business case for potential green hydrogen production also at Quinana. And then that allows for our neighbours, our industrial neighbours, to leverage um, that capacity as well and for uh, um, Quinana to potentially supply the industrial neighbours and also hydrogen for uh, future demand for mobility, for example. Um, and also it uses, it interacts with the electricity system. It's a very large flexible load, the plant. Um, uh, and, and so that's useful for managing the electricity system. And then also it's a large um, load, so large demand. So it's enough to underpin um, investment in new renewables capacity. So you can see that really it's an, that integration. It's not always competition. There are some some um, benefits of the sort of abatement options. You can leverage, um, you know, Hefenese hydrogen and that helps um, provide hydrogen down, uh, down the, potentially in the future when we need hydrogen for mobility. Okay, so look, we think that, you know, we do have all the kind of ingredients, you would say, to be a, um, a uh, to have a really successful um, renewable fuels or low carbon liquid fuels industry here. You know, we have that demand that we've been hearing about um, earlier today. We have that feedstock. Um, you know, we have both the uh, agriculture and biofeedstock as well as um, large potential for renewables for that potential power to liquid in the future. Um, but I guess what, what's sort of missing that we see in other markets where BP is active um, is really, you know, we don't really have that policy, uh, the policy settings here that they have in other markets where we've seen these, um, these products develop and then be, um, be used and have uptake. So this is just to say, you know, these are some of the um, policies that we've been tracking and we s where we see there's actually um, markets developing. So that... Um, that kind of, we really, if we want to have an industry here, um, we can't see that ha really happening unless there's um, uh, commitments from government. And we're really encouraged with the direction um, that we're seeing from state governments as well as from, um, as Brendan was talking about this morning, the direction of travel uh, from, um, from the Australian government, from the, the national government. So. I guess, you know, we can, we imagine we'll still need, we'll still have demand at some point in the future, but we think the time for the policy setting to get it right, it's, it's really now, you know, as, uh, as ourselves and others are looking at investing right now. Um, and, and so if we, if we kind of miss this window, I think um, a lot of our customers will be looking more at an, Im at an import um, future where they'll be importing these fuels from, um, from producers elsewhere and our, our feedstocks will continue to be exported. So we're really encouraging industry to sort of um, come together uh, with government to kind of um, get, this, get the kind of policy settings right now. So these are the sort of three we're really encouraged, we're seeing that these are the three main things that um, we know we need. Uh, we're the guarantee of origin or that sort of sustainability framework, it's really important for low carbon liquid fuels and, and for other fuels um, most likely as well. Um, so we really need to get that going and we're encouraged that we had uh, the commitment to, um, to develop that. But you know, and, and there is international um, ex existing models and approaches that we can leverage, but we do have to get going to get um, to get something that suits Australia and make, make sure that it's appropriate for us. Um, and then we think, uh, like others have said today, you know, there is some policy here. You know, we do have the safeguard and we do have, a, we sort of have an idea about where we're going. We're going to net zero. S all the states have committed, the federal government's legislated. So we know we're the direction of travel. But it's right now, it's probably not um, material enough to support investments like what we want to do in um, Kwanana. So sort of s we do think that we need uh, um, some additional demand policy uh, and 
um, I think the other thing about the safeguard is it doesn't cover all of the fuel, right? It's it's um, only the very large emitters. Um, and so we would definitely want to see uh, additional demand mechanism to kind of underpin the investments and pull, um, pull the use through. And finally, we know that government's talking about production subsidy, and this is really just, um, we think, to kind of make sure that um, in the you know in the long run we agree that Australia has a comparative advantage, um, but other countries are encouraging and supporting um, investment in production, and so you really we want it. There are benefits in having our own um, production capacity here in Australia, and that's really what that production subsidy. Um, for us, we think is is about for Australia. Make sure we've got the production capacity here, and that it can be competitive with the imports. So I'll leave it there, um, and we'll talk some more in the panel. Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Emma and I thought we'd be a bit different and, and come in on a two lady show, um, but essentially, I've uh, we're going to talk to you today about the um, the Byford Rail Extension, which is a, a live project utilising HVO or renewable diesel here in Perth, sponsored through the Metronet Project Works. Um, I was involved in. Um, the initial startup and I guess uh, encouragement of Metronet to to take a chance and uh, invest in this trial and then Emma's been working closely uh, with the operators on uh, on the project site so we thought it'd be great to, to sort of tandem. Uh, so what we'll talk about uh, today just a quick overview of um, Langerock which is who Emma and I represent we are the non-owner uh, non participants in the alliance with uh, the PTA um, delivering the Byford Rail Extension project. So we'll talk about our net zero um, objectives which really helped us to sort of drive this initiative, give you the HVO overview and then um, crack on to the project trial itself. So um, I guess importantly for Langer Rock as a business, uh, we've set ourselves some pretty ambitious targets. We are in a construction industry which is a very hard to abate um, sector um, and we have targets that are, are focused particularly on the 2030 target for operational net zero. So we want to be net zero for our scope one and two emissions by 2030. Um, sorry, it's a bit, bit small. I think all of our um, uh, stuff's been, been um, challenged with the presentation. Uh, but essentially um, what that looks like for Langer Rock as a construction business in terms of our operational net zero pathway when we've modelled it, 92% uh, of our uh, emissions for operations sits within um, our diesel consumption on site. So stationary diesel fleet and our transport fleet as well. So a significant component. And as we go year on year and you know are able to abate our scope two emissions, that profile increases more and more. So just a quick overview of what we're doing already to try and meet those targets. Um, I'll t touch on the B5 biodiesel, so we've mandated that across our projects in Australia. The problem is it's not available or it's very limited availability here in WA, but across on the East Coast we've mandated B5. We've also mandated that any of our off-site facilities um, have to have battery generation as a backup to reduce our um, diesel consumption. And the blue at the bottom um, is through our plant hire business select, we're able to electrify our fleet. So. Um, we, Langer Rock, through Select, have bought in the first two electric crawler cranes, 250 tonne electric crawler cranes, um, manufactured by Lever into Australia, one of which is uh, sitting in Malaga. So for us to decarbonise our scope one and two, we know that there's two pathways that we can take. Many have already talked about it, so I'll breeze through. Obviously, we have the transition pathway of um, electrification. But as everybody said, there are lots of challenges. For us as a construction business, we just can't scale at the time and pace that we need to. There's not the availability of the, the, the equipment that we need to be able to do this. Langer Rook also, um, we also work on long linear infrastructure projects. So charging those electric uh, fleet is, is a challenge to us and we're trying to work through that. Um, and then obviously the other, the other pathway we have to meet our targets is the abatement pathway. Um, so obviously biodiesel and HVO playing a part. But of course, while the solutions are known in market, there are a lot of challenges that many have already talked to, so I won't go through that 
in detail, but obviously for us as a business to scale up, we'd love to, we'd love to use it. And in the UK, our business is mandating HVO in the UK, um, and it has been using it for three years. The difference in the price differential in the UK versus Australia is significant. So for us, it's been more than double. Uh, in the UK, it's you know sort of around that 10%. So onto the trial. Um, I'll set the scene. Um, this is a, a slide that the Australian Contractors Association released this year. Um, but essentially, it was looking at all of our partners within the, the association to see who's been utilising HVO uh, globally. Um, and you'll see the Australian uh, quantum 162,000, predominantly that was through Len Lease's uh, trial with Mars Cranes in New South Wales. Our trial has, bought, has imported 30,000 litres into WA, where the, we believe we're the first construction company to do this in Western Australia. Um, and we've done that in partnership with Refueling Solutions, who've imported it from Neste in Singapore. And we have a very small quantity in New South Wales. So, um, pros. Uh, I guess, obviously for us, it's a transition fuel. Um, it, it overcomes our challenges in the short term. So it's, it's really attractive for us. As you know, um, the transport industry presentation has shown us, there's a lot of locked in uh, investment decisions that are just not going to be easy to electrify in the future. For us, we've seen it as a like for like drop in fuel substitution. There's no requirements for engine modifications. There's no restrictions on blending limits. This is really important for us as a construction business to be able to quickly adopt and scale up. Um, it, it can be produced and distributed within the same facilities as traditional diesel. Um, so that transport infrastructure, we believe, is already established. So, um, and, and for us, it, within delivery space, the torque and maximum power we've seen has been the same as traditional diesel utilising HVO. Um, from an environmental perspective, obviously we have less, less emissions, NOx and PM emissions. And from the Neste supply that we've gotten in for this trial, we've got our certifications showing, you know, we get it, the feedstocks from used cooking oil, so we're getting a 90% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions um, from that substitute in comparison to, to diesel. As everybody said, the, the cons uh, and, and, and the blockers for us to, to scale this up in, a, in the quantities we would like to, um, because it's lacking regu regulatory support, um, it's, it's uneconomical for us at the moment and, um, and I guess we, this is where we need government to, to step in and, and mandate and we need the supply domestically to scale up as well. Um, we have limited availability, availability of product here in Australia. Um, we have had some OEM challenges but I'll let Emma talk to those. Um, just responsible sourcing is, is very important as well and that's been something that Metronet and ourselves have been very careful of, of with this trial and making sure we could get those certificates. Uh, while we do have the same talk and output, um, what we've found in our UK business is that there is a slight calorific difference of about 5% with HVO versus traditional diesel. However, um, through use of it, what we've seen is because HVO cleans the engines, we more than make up for that calorific difference. So really not seeing much of a difference at all uh, overall. So over to Emma. Um, so just before we delve into it, I wanted to give a, pre a brief project overview, so what we're doing on the project. So the Byford Rail Extension, we're extending the rail line eight kilometres from Armadale to Byford, um, and then there's two new stations at either end of that. The Armadale station is going to be elevated on a 1.8 kilometre long viaduct, um, and that's going to remove a number of level crossings. Um, and on top, top of that, we've got a number of bridges and road upgrades that we're doing as well. So that's quite a lot of uh, machinery and uh, effort needed to build this. Uh, a lot of fuel burn millions of litres. There we go. Um, so the objectives of the trial was not essentially to test it. Um, we understand how the fuel works. We essentially want to um, bring it to market at the, the scale that we need. So demonstrating to the wider industry in the construction industry that HBO is a suitable fuel source to achieve low carbon construction. 
while also increasing supply chain confidence that it, it doesn't impede performance. Um, we wanted to positively influence an increase in domestic supply and demand to overcome that cost barrier. So um, this is us screaming that we won't want it um, and that we, we want to use it. Um, we wanted to provide some data for other projects to leverage. So here, someone's done it before. Um, why can't we do the same? Um, and we wanted to use it in uh, machinery that are unlikely to move to electric models at the scale and pace needed to meet net zero objectives. I turned it off. Okay, some photos. So while the trial isn't finished yet, um, so feedback so far ha has pretty much confirmed what we knew from our UK business. There's, there's no difference between using this and traditional diesel, but we needed our supply chain to see this. Um, so yeah, I think so far we're quite successful in demonstrating to the local market that it works. Um, on asking some of our operators, some of them didn't even realize that they had uh, HVO in the machine. So I, I think that's a win. Um, and we've tried to keep our, sort of the workforce and our networks in the loop by doing on-site presentations, letting them know when we're using the fuel, where we're using the fuel, um, and what the benefit is for net zero, uh, doing LinkedIn posts, and of course doing presentations like this um, at conferences just to spread the word. So some lessons learned uh, from this trial. So it was very, very difficult to find manufacturers and sub subcontractors that would agree to use the fuel. Um, we were very lucky that we've got a plant hire subsidiary select who were coming on the journey with us and one very adventurous subcontractor. So just because it's more accepted in Europe, it doesn't mean that our Australian counterparts are willing to use it. Um, and part of this is an education piece. So we found that there was generally a, a lack of knowledge um, as to what HVO or renewable diesel is. Um, a lot of people understood it to be biodiesel, so we had to explain the difference there and sort of provide assurances that um, we, we weren't using biodiesel. It's it a completely different product. Um, also to be aware, like while we're still importing this uh, product, is that it doesn't meet the EN5990 standard, so we needed an exemption to import it, um, which we organised through Refueling Solutions, our partner. Um, data collection wasn't very straightforward either, so attempt number one was physical data sheets where we had our operators um, keeping a log of uh, vehicle movements and use and refilling. Um, but a construction site is not a safe place to pull off and uh, record notes um, on the side of the, well, the side of the track really, so, and we were never going to get the accuracy that we wanted just out of, um, you know, people taking their own notes. Attempt number two is currently underway, so we're extracting telematic data. Um, and this requires qualified technicians from each manufacturer, um, sorry, each equipment supplier. Um, and the assumptions that we get from this, look behind this data aren't always clear either. So um, we're working through our own issues on that as well. But um, in summary, I suppose, if you want to gain data from a trial with this fuel, I would discuss that with the equipment manufacturers. But there's so much literature available on HVO already. Um, uh, as I said, our clear objective was to prove that it, it works. Um, and that people shouldn't be afraid of this transitionary fuel. So in summary, um, Langerork, we see HVO100 as the short-term silver bullet to meet our operational net zero objectives. Um, it's a working practice in our UK business and it's our mission to make it the same in our Australian business. So we know it works, um, we need our supply chain to know it works, so equipment and uh, machine suppliers, um, and we need our client to know it works as well. So. Um, Essentially, what we tried to do is generate that demand. Um, so we're ready for the fuel whenever, whenever it's here for us. Um, we just want to reiterate, I suppose, what everyone else has been saying, that um, we need government policy to catch up and sort of help drive down prices and increase supply to the country. It's a bit of a missed opportunity for local economy um, to not capitalise on this. Uh, I'll just finish on one stat I think was mentioned at the uh, beginning of the day. So 45% of Australia's energy use um, is from liquid fuels. So we realistically cannot meet our net zero objectives without renewable diesel um, and other low carbon liquid fuels. So thank you for your time um, and hopefully we can answer a few questions on the trial uh, at the Q&A panel. Hi, um, I'm Tamar Jordan, uh, the Global uh, Procurement Lead for Rio Tinto and also the Biofuels Lead for Rio Tinto. 
I have the um, very dubious honour of being the last speaker in this session, so please bear with me. Uh, I can promise you there's one graph, but it's conceptual, and I do have some pictures of trucks and trees, so hopefully that makes it all um, good to go. Very excited to be here today talking about biofuels, um, particularly about biofuels and mining. In mining, we have historically looked at how to stretch technological barriers to find new and better ways of doing things. And faced with the decarbonisation challenge they're all faced with, I think it's more important than ever that we think about new and better ways of finding a way through. The fact that I'm up here talking to the background of a picture of Pangamia seedlings, I think is a testament to the fact that we're thinking about this one a little bit differently. But more about the Pangamia later. I'll first talk to you about the overarching um, Rio Tinto decarbonisation commitments that we've made, hopefully. Got it. <laughs> okay, so we've committed to 50% reduction in scope one and two by 2030. That's underpinned by a commitment of five to six billion dollars in spend to support the decarbonisation of our assets. We've also ultimately committed to net zero by 2050. In that broader context of Rio Tinto's emissions, diesel is actually only about 12% of our global emissions. Um, over 70% of our emissions come from our aluminium business, um, both from generation of electricity and process heat. That said, where we're standing here today in WA, our iron ore business, over 70% of the emissions from that business are in fact from diesel. The transition from diesel is a global and complex journey for us. The 1.6 billion litres that we buy a year is used across a variety of different equipment types. So that diesel goes into our haul trucks, our locomotives, loaders, dozers, excavators, graders, and other ancillary equipment. Ultimately, and I think this has been spoken about quite a bit already, we see the answer as electrification of our mobile equipment. That said, and also already spoken about, there's a lot of challenges to that journey. For us, the flexibility that's required both in mine plans, infrastructure locations, and where we apply that, and we talked a little bit about asset life cycle as well earlier when Mark was speaking, makes it challenging. The higher energy density batteries that we require and the technological breakthroughs that we require make it challenging. The robustness that we need in harsh environments and the access to green electrons from a grid also make that quite challenging. And bearing in mind up in the Pilbara, we're not connected to the main grid, we have our own, so we're building one gigawatt of renewable power in the Pilbara as well at the moment. While we see that as the ultimate aim, we also see a role for biofuels as complementary to that journey, both in the ability to transition off some of our diesel now, and also as a transitionary and complementary pathway to some of those equipment types that prove harder to electrify over time. And we're doing it now. So we were so excited last year to announce that we had transitioned our boron operations in California to 100% renewable fuels. So no more fossil fuels delivered to that site. It was a very exciting journey and I'm uh, thankful to James at Neste for not stealing my thunder earlier when he had it slightly mentioned on his slide. Uh, but we worked very closely with Rolls-Royce and Neste on that journey. That's been the equivalent of about 10,000 cars a year of emissions reduction for us. We've built quickly on that success, and this year, this quarter, in fact, we're on track to complete the transition of our Kennecott mine in Utah um, onto 100% renewable fuels as well. That would be the equivalent of about 110,000 cars, so more than tenfold increase in the um, emissions impact in that space. Our journey so far in this space, the key learnings have been around innovation, collaboration, and partnership. In the boron example, the idea actually came from one of our team members at site who pushed it forward as part of a pioneering pitch program that we run. That went from an idea to a trial to a full transition over a two-year period. And when obviously with Kennecott, we've been able to fast follow. Again, they're working in conjunction with Rolls-Royce, Neste, Cummins, and HF Sinclair, and all of our other OEMs to ensure the support and warranties of all the various engine types that are involved in a transition like that was also key. That said, the regulatory environment and environmental settings in um, North America have made it feasible for us to start there. We mentioned earlier, I think it was James from Deloitte mentioned a four to five times increase in uh, cost of renewable diesel versus fossil. In Boron, we were able to that make that transition a pretty much parity with fossil diesel. Massive difference from the economics. I think we all again have mentioned quite a bit about the economic feasibility of these solutions. In Australia, the vast majority of that 1.6 billion litres we buy a year is used here, 
and we're very keen to find a solution in this space. We see a massive opportunity for sustainable biofuels industry here. However, we see that the current feedstock supply is just not sustainable to meet that potential demand. We welcome the work already underway that again has been mentioned quite a bit today on the low carbon fields initiative with the government. But we're also starting to think about what else can we do to help stimulate the supply of sustainable feedstocks in this region. We've looked at a variety of feedstocks and continue to look at a variety of feedstocks and obviously it's a fascinating technological landscape in this space. But we're particularly um, interested in Pongamia. And um, we spent a bit of time now looking at Pongamia. It's a native tree, fast growing, does well in harsh conditions, drought tolerant, salinity tolerant, even makes its own nitrogen to help improve soil um, content over time. And seems to hold the potential to have very high yielding feedstock uh, opportunity. There's a lot we don't know about Pongamia and a lot we do, but we certainly know enough to know that we'd like to know some more. One of the key pieces here is the fact that the Pongamia tree itself, when you harvest it, it's a, a shake system. So the tree itself uh, stays in situ and that permanence of carbon sequestration opportunity is there. When I talk to my nature-based solutions colleagues, they tell me that the best tree you have is the one you planted 10 years ago and the next best tree is the one you plant today. So in the interest of R&D and furthering our understanding in this space, we're going to plant some trees. I promised you pictures of trees. Um, so we announced a couple of weeks ago that we are going to run a Pongamia seed farm pilot. We're establishing that in Queensland. That'll be a 3,000 hectare pilot where we will grow over 750,000 Pongamia trees. The outcomes of that pilot from a, an offtake perspective, you're talking about 11 million litres per annum, which obviously in the, the grander 1.6 billion litre story is a small drop in the ocean. So the focus of this trial is really around R&D. It's trying to understand better the feasibility of Pongamia as a feedstock in this space. We will work closely with our partners at um, Midway, who will operate the farm for us and work closely with them on that R&D focus. I do want to mention the just transition. I think there's massive opportunity for um, the region to, for biofuels to support the decarbonisation journey, but also for economic and regional and indigenous opportunities in the communities and indigenous businesses we work alongside. We're already seeing massive opportunities in the work that we're doing in building renewable energy in the Pilbara, in working in conjunction with traditional owners. Even in the Pongamia space, we did a small-scale trial initially um, on post-mining use sand in Gove um, on 20 hectares where we planted 10,000 trees. Working with the local indigenous businesses there, we were able to get support from them to um, meet the project's nursery needs, tree staking needs, and um, native planting needs of the project. So again, small scale, but you start to see the, the opportunity that's potentially there when we um, unlock those opportunities and do all these projects that we're talking about today in the right way. In summary, we see biofuels as a significant opportunity in this space and the part of our energy future. We think the pathway to that is through collaboration, partnership and innovation. And the conversations we're all having here today and beyond today is key to unlocking this opportunity for us all. I feel privileged to be on the journey with you all and I feel excited about the ongoing conversation and hopefully some very easy questions on the panel. <laughs> and with that, I just thank you very much. Some fantastic presentations there, and thank you to all our presenters. Lots of common themes coming through education and research, policy, investment, market demand, communities, and collaboration. Nicely touched on at the end there by Tamar. Unless anyone's bursting out the gates, I'm going to put the first question back to Tamar about Pongamia, because that's really sparked my interest. Um, how do you plan to process it, and can GrainCorp help? <laughs> Um, so, look, all part of the R&D approach that we're trying to take. So, within that um, pilot, we are testing growing conditions, implications on yield, but also we will look at how we test further the entire value chain and what those potential partnerships might look like, um, certainly exploring various options in that space. That said, to get to full-scale industrial harvest, you're talking about five years. So we de-risk and increase our understanding year by year by understanding early mortality rates, early vita vitality rates and growth rates. But to that high level harvesting, heavy intensive industrial level harvest, you're about a five year period to that. 
a little bit of time to chat yet. Yeah, call me, call me in five years. Yeah. <laughs> well. Thank you. Any questions from the crowd? Here, kick us off. Well, all right, we can talk about a bit more about education, perhaps, across each of the industries. Um, uh, the team from Langer Rock was talking about, you know, um, research into the impact on engines, for example, and maybe dispelling some of the myths that are out there. We've talked about food versus fuel earlier today. Uh, open question, I guess, to the panel about any other myths that we're trying to dispel within your various industries and perhaps what's needed either from government on or from other players in your industry to help with that. Everyone's looking at me because I'm holding the microphone. <laughs> okay. um, look, uh, when, you, when uh, it was mentioned earlier about the biodiesel, it was certainly we found the same internally on our change journey, talking to our maintenance people at site. Not big fans of biodiesel. <laughs> um, but working with them to, to educate and understand what we're actually talking about in this space and renewable diesel and the differences there was certainly a, a key part of getting that, um, that change management and internal cultural journey and acceptance. Um, major fans now in both Boron and Kennecott in that space, so that's been fantastic. I, I can comment quickly, um, particularly in the domestic commercial vessel sector, there's, there's a lot of misinformation and misunderstanding about what the OEM um, view is on utilisation of biofuels and, and in particular renewable diesel. I think biodiesel is different because that, that can be a drop in fuel for a segment of our industry, um, but certainly the, the height, the the, the, the smaller vessels um, are much more sensitive to, to product. So I, I think that, uh, that it's, it's the same kind of OEM issue with the construction and mining industry. Um, and, and it's a very much an, an education process. Um, and I have found it's also personality driven. Um, people have quite fixed ideas <laughs> about things. And, and so that, that sort of education and collaboration and, um, you know, trying to make everyone part of the discussion and, and a part of the discovery is really important for that sector. Yeah, I, th I think with uh, trucking too, um, biodiesel in particular has a, a pretty bad rap. Um, yeah, we can run it at 5% in, in any engine, but once you get above that, I think um, yeah, some trials have shown sort of some problems and there is that education piece to, to convince operators that renewable diesel is quite different to biodiesel. Mm. Can I just add to the OEM piece? Because, uh, so Langer Rock, uh, when we were talking to our supply chain and talking to manufacturers about using HVO, we had a trial happening in Queensland for a company um, that was utilizing the same equipment we wanted to use, and they weren't even talking to each other as a business. Uh, and so breaking down those barriers and really kind of, you know, obviously for us, our trial is a drop in the ocean. It was very small because that's what we could get funding for. But talking widely about it and, and being able to share knowledge and experience and to try and sort of lift that education of everybody, in the, you know, from uh, somebody who's working on site as a labourer to, you know, an, a CEO of a company. I think the more people that know about it, I think the more decisions can be made in the positive. Um, I'll just say we did participate in an early trial in, um, with BHP and um, it's fair to say, you know, the fact that we didn't have a fuel standard and it wasn't, there wasn't a specification and we had to have a um, go through that process that everyone's had to go through um, to get the exemption, you know, that, that definitely hasn't helped, I think. Um, but really encouraging that work and hopefully we'll have that in place really soon. Um, and I think that will just be that one extra barrier that um, I, I think we have been facing um, will be removed. So really looking forward to that. Brendan? Uh, th thanks very much. I found that extremely interesting and I've got literally a ton of questions that I could ask, but I'll try and uh, target them. Just with uh, Langer Rock, I just wanted to confirm um, with your trial that you're doing, you're not blending at all, you're just putting, you're dropping in completely. And then for, for, for Rio, uh, I just wanted to, to understand, can you explain how they've achieved that price parity between HVO and, um, and fossil equivalent? 
in the US. And then I'll, while I've got the microphone, I'll just do one more while I'm at it and I'll, I'll, I'll load it up. I was just wondering, uh, Angela, I'm pretty keen to understand where the, um, the methanol conversation is at the moment. In your presentation, I un understood where you were at with, um, with ammonia and also where you're at with the other, the other potentials. But with methanol in particular, I'm just keen to understand where that's up to um, from an international context. But I might go to you first, Tamar. Oh, sorry. I, I just yep. to say with the Langer Rook question, yes, we're using HVO, so no blending. <laughs> Um, thanks. And my question, you might want to ask James from Neste where he can offer me a good price, but um, <laughs> I'm buying it. Um, look, I think it's a combination in that environment, both um, between the legislative um, requirements in the space um, and also the incentives in the provision of, of feedstocks in that space as well. So it's the same as what we've been talking about at, um, all day. It's the policy settings that support demand and supply. Um, and again, California in particular, there's been California-specific legislation and mandates that have driven that, so that was a good place for us to start. Um, but Utah, we're, we're also seeing the, in the same region, not quite as attractive as California, but you can see in the same region. And I think it's, it's showing that with those right settings and with the right supply, um, it can be achieved. Yeah, I'll, I'll, can I just add a little bit to that parity? Um, question as well because one of our members runs B100 in the Great Lakes um, in Canada and that they're able to do that almost at price parity as well. So there's a little bit of a hit because of the efficiencies, I mean the calorific value is slightly less. So, so, so those stacked policy measures that, that occur in the Northern Hemisphere really work. Um, I don't know. The, it's quite complex, so I can't run you through it. But I can provide you with the information from 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 C CSL who do that in, in Canada. So it's really interesting to know what they do there. On on methanol, um, I guess methanol has an advantage in that it's there's methanol carriers. It's widely traded around the world. I mean, so is ammonia. Um, but the methanol carriers, the engines run on methanol as well. So it's a tested technology. Um, the cha challenge is, um, you know, the carbon input for, for, the, for the production of methanol. There's some really great pilot projects around the country that have a carbon, an industrial carbon source, so good circular economy stuff happening. I, I think one of the things with methanol is MERSC came out quite publicly and when one of the big ship owners um, stakes a claim and, and makes an announcement like that, uh, it kind of does a lot to drive um, confidence in that particular product. They've stepped a little bit away from that and I, I don't know exactly what's going on there but supply is, is an issue. Um, global policy, as I mentioned, the, 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 the global bunker fuel tax, um, levy, whatever you want to call it, is really important um, and there's a global fuel standard being developed as well. So those two measures are going to be really important to build that confidence in investment and, and allow operate allow producers to invest, um, to allow ports to, to invest in the infrastructure, to give ship owners confidence to, to build the vessels that can run on these products. It, it, it is the classic chicken and egg. Um, but methanol is looking pretty promising for Australia. Some of the other issues are around, you know, bunkering, um, emergency response that I know AMPS are quite... Um, you know, concerned about how they need to restructure their or, or redesign their emergency response capabilities to address these new fuels. So there's a lot of issues, but fundamentally it's a policy issue. The rest, I think, kind of takes care of itself. I don't know if that answers your methanol question, but it's very <laughs> uncertain. Do I hand over here before? Any questions? He stepped outside. Oh, he stepped outside. Okay, no worries. Uh, if we're talking about other technologies, perhaps, Pauline, I'll go to you. Um, obviously, out at the Quinana um, hub, where you're looking at low-carbon liquid fuels and hydrogen as well, how does BP sort of, I guess, balance the split of research and feasibility work and investment between the different technologies, and how do you see them interplaying in the short and the long term? Yeah, um, well, in Quinana, it's, it's pretty integrated. It's an integrated energy hub. You know, we wouldn't have... You know, it would be very difficult to get the hydrogen... Uh, have the hydrogen business case uh, look um, kind of be there if we didn't have a demand for hydrogen ourselves in the heifer process. Um, and of course that means um, 
you know, ho hopefully we're, we're shortlisted in the Hydrogen Head Start um, program. So that is also reliant on, on um, policy and, um, and um, you know, investment by government. But that would mean then that, you know, our industrial uh, neighbours who need it for industrial use, they, they can leverage that, in, um, that uh, investment and, and also we can have it for, um, for mobility. So, you know, I guess it's not always a, a competition. You know, I think I heard somebody um, saying, oh, we need to do something about, uh, you know, we need to kind of get the cost down on, um, on power for power to liquids. Well, you know, one way to do that is we have to get better at, at um, we have to get better at producing the uh, the green hydrogen, and to do that, you need um, you need to learn by doing, uh, and that's the only way to actually realise learning rates that are assumed in these models is you have to actually learn, um, and so you know, one way to do that is well, you know you do need hydrogen for for HEFA, and so it's not necessarily. Um, that they're completely competing these um, pathways. They, they will, they can be complementary. Uh, and I guess the other thing is, is that you know, um, for almost all of the low carbon um, uh, options, except for sort of perhaps some efficiency, um, you know, they they come at a cost compared to fossil, and that's why we need policy really to drive um, to kind of. Drop, close that green premium and drive the uptake. Um, and, it, and we've heard from a lot of companies, there is actually corporate um, will to, to, to trial and, and reduce emissions. Um, but, you know, doing it on your own in the absence of the sort of broader policy, it's actually really hard. Even, even, um, even for really large players like Rio, um, you'll see that they've, they've tr it's easier for them. They've started in those jurisdictions where they've got that policy support. So, you know, it, it can be quite difficult um, to, you know, it would be quite difficult even if you had the, um, the, the capital and the commitment, it can be quite difficult to go alone. So that's, yeah, I guess that's what we're hearing from our customers. There's a variety. They're not always competing. We can learn, you know, what we can learn... Um, one technology uh, pathway can actually help uh, lower the cost of another. So um, that's kind of where we're going, yeah. Okay. Also, flexibility is key. We need to have investments that um, we need, you know, we don't have a crystal ball, we don't have certainty, so we're kind of trying to design flexibility into our strategy. Yep, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, sorry if it was covered, but... My understanding of some of the um, biofuels is they might offer the opportunity to have side products that allow you to be carbon negative, i.e. to sequester the carbon through the soil. Is there anything that's been looked at, uh, particularly I suppose on the grain corp or the growers side of things, uh, where that, uh, that side that can help offset some of the costs of the fuels and once you take into account the safeguarding mechanism actually it, it ends up as a net positive? Um, I'm not a grower, but I'll talk a bit about Pangemia in, in yeah. that um, frame. So certainly the economics of uh, Pangemia as a biofuel um, also hinge on the additional value streams. So there is the oil seed, which can be crushed to create the oil for HVO. Um, the residual element there, there's potential cattle meal. The pod itself is potential biomass, all of which hopefully have value. But also then there is the potential of um, the safeguard mechanisms and the accus. Currently, there isn't a methodology that would support that. So we have submitted a proponent-led methodology suggestion um, under the, the expressions of interest went out earlier this year um, for projects like that, where um, you're growing trees, but the economics actually have the additionality because without them, the whole piece doesn't stack up. But I think there's definitely an opportunity in that space of how can we leverage the safeguard, safeguard mechanism to both support those types of projects and the biofuels industry at the same time. I mean, I will just add as well, in other markets, in other places in the world, often the demand mechanism or the supply um, incentive, the production incentive, it's based on what's called the life cycle emissions, uh, so the LCA. And some of those, you know, they all have quite different approaches, but some of those approaches do actually incorporate or allow for um, 
emission, additional emission reductions or on-farm um, practices to be reflected in the LCA. And so that would then mean you would have an incentive, um, uh, you know, you would get an incentive to undertake those activities on farm. So you can design, we can design policy in Australia um, along those lines as well. Yeah. I'd probably just add to both of those comments to say, um, your comments around the life cycle assessment are absolutely spot on in, in terms of actually capturing the practices on farm in Australia. We've been doing a lot of work with growers and, and industry groups to make sure that frameworks like Corsair, which was mentioned earlier today, or indeed the new framework or through the Guarantee of Origin scheme, that we are actually capturing the sustainable and very high quality practices that Australian farmers currently employ on their properties. At the moment, we don't feel that it's quite accurately reflected. So there's a lot of work going into that space in the next sort of six or so months as well. Yes. This is for the um, trucking industry. Um, you mentioned that there are efficiencies to be gained by uh, getting bigger trucks. And uh, I just a comment after reading some stuff from the Eastern States recently about the investment in roads that would be required. Uh, it doesn't, it's not an exact subsidy into um, biofuels, but the ability to get efficiencies out of trucking by more, uh, better roads. Yes, I, I guess that um, there's certainly been a, a lot of infrastructure uh, that's, that's been built um, around Sydney, B Brisbane, uh, and to some extent Melbourne um, to provide better, better roadways um, and, and actually sort of reduce travel times and, and reduce sort of, I guess, the fuel, current fossil fuel diesel usage. Um, but I think that at the end of the day, that's going to be still quite limited. I mean, I, I think that uh, by using larger combination vehicles, carrying the equivalent amount of freight on a, a B double versus a semi reduces CO2 emissions by about 28%. So there's some fairly significant gains to be had there. Whereas I don't think you know the, the cost of the infrastructure you'd have to, to build to, to streamline the, the road network take out the hills as such, I, I think is, is not going to sort of, you know, um, lead to a, a, a significant reduction in CO2. You'll still want to go after those, any efficiency gains anyway, right, as a sector, even if you're, um, if you're using electricity or if you're using um, renewable fuels. It, it's not really a one or the, like with efficiency, it's not really a one or the other. You wouldn't worry about it because you're doing, you're electrifying. I mean, you were st you're still going to, um, you're still going to chase those efficiencies is my yeah, understanding. De <laughs> yeah. de definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, you're, you're certainly not going to walk away from it. But, um, but, but equally, I mean, if, if, if government's looking for their best bang for their buck, uh, frankly, we'd prefer to see sort of, you know, uh, electrical charging infrastructure uh, being put in for trucks. There's a lot going in for light vehicles, but there's very little going in for, for trucks. So sort of it makes it hard unless uh, if you're uh, not back to base and able to charge sort of at, at your depot each night, it's very hard to run a, a battery electric truck at this point in time, for example. So, um, and, and sorry, and I think that's, that's where we see sort of government's role, sort of both in regulation, but also to, to foster um, those infrastructure networks. Now, be that sort of, you know, the, the, the manufacturer of, um, you know, renewable fuels um, or that charging infrastructure, etc. Because I think that to leave that solely um, for private industry is going to be really difficult because uh, you get back this chicken and egg. But sort of unless you've got that, that, that infrastructure from a private uh, company's point of view, you're not going to actually going to make a, a, any money out of that for maybe a decade or something like that. So uh, I think that's where government's role is to actually sort of, you know, help build that, that infrastructure to enable sort of, you know, these, uh, these other transport technologies to, to actually be used. There's been a lot of talk about policy um, today and I, th I guess another open question to the panel around uh, there's a lot of voices going up to government, both at a state and federal level. There's plenty of consultations that have been underway, as Brendan outlined earlier today. How have your engagements at a state and or federal level been on this topic in particular? And would you want to ask anything more of government beyond the policy ask that we've outlined today? 
Um, I mean, just very briefly, the, we've done been doing some joined up advocacy with um, some of the end users, including Mark and the construction industry and um, Emma from aviation, and uh, with Commonwealth, Queensland, New South Wales Parliament. Um, with one exception, everyone can see the logic and can see the national benefit. Um, can't see a downside. So, you know, the, I think the reception is is very positive. Um, they un, they seem to get the issues. They seem to get the opportunity. But how that translates into policy and action in the lead up to an election is is another thing. Um, and that seems to be. I don't want to get into politics, but it seems very divisive at the moment, which 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 is not very helpful. So bipartisanship, I think, would be an incredibly although unrealistic, um, an incredibly welcome thing. And I don't think anyone in this room would disagree with that. Yeah, have to, have to agree. I mean, it's, it's quite frustrating, um, I guess, when you, um, you can talk to sort of you know, one side of politics um, and they're all for it and just for political reasons, sort of, you know, the, the, the other mob are, are not so keen, even though they can probably actually see the value in it. Okay, we have a question over here. Oh, sorry, Pauline. Did you oh, that's okay. I mean, we've, we've, there's been a lot of momentum, right, in this space for sure over the last couple of years, and that's really encouraging. Um, but you know, the world is the rest of the world is also moving along, and you know, we're in you know we're a global company. We've got global capital choices, uh, and it does feel a bit like um, you know it's a wonderful progress, but we do need to kind of make make some decisions pretty quickly. Um, yeah. Can I just follow up? One thing that I think frustrates me as a, being in the sustainability space for a, a long time, I don't understand why we need to reinvent the wheel here in Australia. If we've got policy stand, uh, fuel standards in Europe and America that work, why are we in inventing something different and starting from scratch here in, in Australia? It would be good to see it fast tracked and learnings be you know adopted from overseas. Yeah. Some advantage to not being the first mover in this scenario. Uh, probably got time for one final question over here. Yeah, I'm lucky to be able to sneak in the final question. Uh, Max van Summeren from Bivios. There was a talk about how there are that's easier to achieve cost parity with uh, operations in Europe and, and in North America. If you get everything that you want, so you get the mandates and you get the policy support, and the industry is able to grow here. What kind of quantum of change do you think that will create to the cost of production of biofuels in Australia? I mean, obviously, I'm not involved in the production of biofuels. I'm involved in the procurement of biofuels. <laughs> um, all I can say is where, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, where those settings seem to be right, we seem to be able to access it. So that's been the case in Boron, that's been the case in Kennecott, and certainly from our perspective, it would be fantastic if that was the case here, because we really are keen to find that pathway in Australia. I, I think we have to be realistic about um, what is actually going on in, in these other markets. So um, yes, the cost of uh, production will be improving. We're getting better at um, growing the feedstock, our, you know, the processes, the pro processes are getting more efficient and definitely costs will come down but it's actually about who is paying um, who is how are we actually paying for um, the difference between the fossil and the low carbon liquid fuel and actually say in California they have a regulatory system and it's the um, you know effectively the the fossil fuel users who are um, paying for their emissions associated with the fossil fuel, um, and and that is helping to subsidise the um, the uptake of the low carbon liquid fuels. So, I, I think that like, and that's sort of roughly what's happening in Europe as well, and in the UK where you it, it's it's about who is actually paying that green premium and driving the uptake, uh, and there are. You know there are these externalities associated with fossil fuel, and that's what those um, those policy settings are actually um, you know addressing. Uh, so yeah, hopefully that helps you understand. There will there are definitely improvements in in costs, but this is actually about who is paying for the um, difference. 
I'll just add to that. Taxpayers as well, because yeah. tax incentives as well. But I do think that what we're seeing at the moment, and we hear James from Deloitte saying four to five times the price of fossil, I don't think that all of that is production cost. There is scarcity margins baked in there because of access to feedstocks at scale, as well as refinery access at scale. Yeah. So I think there are opportunities on both sides there as well. And also um, the uh, cost differential between, say, HBO and other markets and fossils is, um, it does go up and down. And um, I think that four times is not our current, um, what we're currently seeing in other markets. I think it's more <coughs> like two. So there are different views. Uh, you know, you can get information about what the cost difference is between, uh, say, renewable diesel and um, fossil diesel. Argus and others, there are actual price um, markers out there that you can have a look at for other markets. Thank you. We're going to get into trouble from Adele here, so we'll wrap it up. <laughs> thank you very much to our panellists. Please join me again in thanking them.